So, um, hello everybody. Thank you very much for joining me today to talk about um, it's an ongoing journey in building a game engine through or with on top of .NET MAUI. Um, well, I'm going to hopefully talk through some of the, the journey and then we'll, we'll maybe look at some of the actual outcomes of, of building this, this engine. Um, get the quick introduction out of the way. Uh, my name is Sean Lawrence. I'm a software engineer. Uh, I've recently been very lucky to be granted Microsoft MVP at the start of this year. Um, and that's mostly based on some of the, the open source work that I do, which is on the .NET MAUI community toolkit, the Xamarin community toolkit, which is not being moonlighted, but it's um, falling down the pecking order. And this new thing that we're talking about today, possibly called the Orbit Engine, but we'll um, cover that again. Um, so, uh, so I repeat, uh, we, we are today we're going to cover a general concepts of around what a game is, because it's potentially rather different to the typical development that we do from day to day. Um, and then how our current journey has led me on to trying to take the lessons that I've learned in building a game and then apply it to something that could be reused for future ideas that I've got and potential uh, use for the community. Uh, th 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 there's a key aspect of trying to not do too much with this, this engine that we're trying to build in the fact that, I, I mean, I, I guess ultimately the, part of the reason to use .NET MAUI is the fact that it already offers a, a whole host of the ability to build UI, uh, a large array of abstracted API access for all of the different platforms, whether it's accessing the accelerometer or, or other parts like that. So actually we get a lot out of the box by just using .NET MAUI. The bit that we don't get is the fact of the the concept of the end a, a game itself, um, and then ultimately we're, we're going to then look at the journey ahead because it's definitely very much a work in progress. But uh, as we see along the way, I'm I'm hoping to get to at least to a point of something being usable for the the gen general public within the next within the coming weeks to, to months. Um, so the first real conceptual difference from building a business application to building a game is it's a kind of, I guess, a, a, a looping pattern. Now, if anyone has built a, a real-time based system, so uh, PLC programming, uh, I've not done in the past, but I've worked with people that have, where, it, for example, it might be a pharmaceutical machine where it is sat there and it's constantly polling, it gives a, a module or process a chunk of time to go and do its job, stop, and then moves on to the next process. That, that's a little bit more strict than what we're looking at in terms of a game, because if in that scenario, if you're ever going to, um, if, you, if you're going to exceed the allocated time, you're you're pulled from from existence. Your your code stops executing because it has to move on to the next next component or module that needs to be given its, its slice of time. In a game, uh, we typically, we don't do that. And actually that's sometimes when you start to experience things like lagging or ultimately if, well, if that continues, you're ultimately, your, your game's gonna grind to a halt and you're not ever going to, um, you're gonna get a freeze or a hang or a crash. Um, but the general concept is we, we sit there and we just keep looping around. We, <sighs> There's this idea of processing user inputs, so whether we're capturing from the mouse, from keyboard, touch, possibly accelerometer, any kind of interaction that the user can do with the game and uh, play a part in uh, controlling uh, the game elements. Then uh, this is where we start to then actually deal with, we then see, uh, we then are given uh, the ability to update our state. Now, I'll allude to this a bit more later on, but the states where you're storing it wants to be separate from the device you're running. 
um, and I'll show you some quite good examples later later on. And then what the, the final state is the rendering, and we, we then convert that state across to something that's put on screen. Once those three steps have finished, the code sits there for a period of time until it's then ready to come around again. That, that waiting period is typically defined by your desired frame rate, so if you want to run it. Uh, I think the, the typical basic at the moment is you, you wait for roughly 16 milliseconds, which will give you a 62 and a half uh, frames per second, which is actually much more than we need for uh, most gaming options. So if you can build a game that works and with that kind of frame rate, then actually uh, you, you're going to get really good performance. There are different mechanisms around how you define how long to wait for. Some places say, well, I'll just wait for a concrete 16 milliseconds. Others might say, well, you've taken two milliseconds on the right to process, therefore I'll only, I'll only wait for 14 milliseconds. So how does this, this kind of the game loop fit into, I guess, .NET MAUI? Um, Donald Murray actually provides us with two key components that actually makes it relatively straightforward to do. Um, it gives us the, the graphics view, which is effectively a 2D canvas, or a canvas where you can render 2D graphics on. Um, this has been built based off some open source work that I think John Lipsky did. I originally actually assumed it came from Skia which it doesn't. Um, I think the reason why it doesn't is Skia adds overheads in terms of deployment size. Uh, that, that seems to be their only real overhead, if that makes sense. Performance, I think they're, they're fairly on par, but I do actually have some, some plans to do some profiling to check whether there are certain scenarios where Skia might be better in Maori.graphics otherwise. Um, and I've recently, thankfully, had some confirmation from the .NET MAUI team is the fact that while I've built this on top of graphics view, you can continue to do that. You don't have to swap any implementation de detail out in terms of the game engine design to, to use Skia. Actually, there's a, I don't want to say a couple of lines of code, but there is a process of saying, well, at the moment it's using the MAUI graphics rendering engine. We can swap it out to use the Skia and graphics rendering engine but still look like the .NET MAUI uh, graphics in terms of how we interact with it, which is another great reason to help um, reduce the workload in terms of getting an engine out and not having to run the risk of the more code you have, the more maintenance you're going to deal with. Um, the, 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 the graphics view itself, what you typically have is you say, here is a, a view on the screen. It can render anything, but it you then have to pass it something to, to do the drawing. And this is this single drawing, iDrawable implementation. This is what uh, I've now abstracted in terms of the engines. So actually, you're going to have a, a scene, which would represent a level. You will pass that into the graphics view, and it will then start to, 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 to handle the drawing for you you just tell it to draw the, the detail that you need, whether that's a background image, whether you want to stick uh, a player on the screen. Uh, it, it can grow to multiple levels of complexity, and that's entirely up to you. Uh, and then finally, the, the eye dispatcher, which doesn't do too much, but it allows us to, say, do this act, piece of work after this period of time. And that all delegates down to the platform specific layers. So there's a lot of, of the heavy lifting that's actually done through .NET MAUI. So if we can then look back at our previous slide, um, our loop from the previous slide, we can then start to see how it fits with uh, what I've just said. Um, at the moment, user interaction is entirely up to you. Uh, this is this is a difficult one because 
I think, as I mentioned, you could have mouse support, you could have keyboard support, you could have touch support, shaking. And in that regard, I'm not convinced there's going to, is there ever truly going to be a one size fits all implementation for this? I'd like to get to a point of having something that could at least cover a large number of scenarios. But at the moment, I'm not strictly sure I know what those scenarios are. So if anyone starts to have ideas on things, that's this is quite crucial feedback. Um, I have started to try and come up with quite different concepts of games to try and drive the thought process on this, but I'm not sure I've got to a point of saying, well, I'll, I'll just handle this scenario. Uh, so once you've you've done your, your input processing, then we come on to actually telling our code that we can then up, go and update the state, the state. Now, you'll forgive on the right, I have deleted, I've removed a bit of code that just calculates time information just so I can actually get it to fit on the screen. But essentially what we're saying is we've got a, a game scene, which I mentioned is the iDrawable Im implementation. And ultimately what you say is your scene will be called, your up, the update method on your scene will be called and it'll say uh, it's been 16 milliseconds since you were last updated and therefore you could adjust. So if you've got maybe a side scrolling platformer, you could move your scene or your, uh, however you're representing the background, that might be a game object that might be the scene. You could move the uh, rendering along to show that you're getting a, a steady animation. Um, and I, I've mixed the two again, and I have to be very careful with that. Um, I did mention about moving the screen along. The state should represent that the screen will move along, but actually it's only when you come to the rendering uh, implementation that the screen does move along. So you might say is, you know, that the screen, the player is at now 10% of the level. So therefore, when you come to the, the update and you were at, so maybe so you were at 9%, the screen will actually never get uh, slide in to, to show the ten percent stage. Uh, and then the last part of the loop, we just wait, and this is where the, the dispatcher implementation comes in. We just get to say, well, you've taken ten milliseconds. You're supposed to take, you're supposed to wait for sixteen, but actually we're only going to wait for six to then hopefully give you this this steady frame rate. Uh, and that just calls back on itself to then give us this constant process. And that, that again, this, this reinforces the, the big difference between, I guess, a business application and uh, a game in the fact that a business application will just sit there and it'll wait for the user to, to provide it with input. Now, you could loose, loosely argue that if no input is put in, then maybe actually the game won't have to re render new any change on screen. Um, but it's still there checking to see whether it has. Uh, so to try and make life easier in terms of building a game, this, this engine at the moment, it will give you uh, what's the class called a, a game scene view. So this gives you the ability to render your, your scene on the screen. Uh, there isn't too much in terms of implementation that you have to provide. You can just add it. Uh, this is... A, and this is an inheritance of the graphics view. So this is where you could potentially get all of the touch support that I had a link in the, the previous slide. So it gives you um, gives you events when you touch the screen, when you start interacting, when you end interacting, and also if you're dragging around. It does that for, uh, so touch and click are kind of covered together, but then you've also got hover as well. So if you're moving the mouse, within the bounds, you could show something without necessarily actually handling the, the actual cl click. Uh, we had a game scene view. Next, we have a game scene. And this is our, as I mentioned, the, the iDrawable implementation to give back to the .NET Maui layer to know how to render something. Typically, there's only three methods that you need, two methods that you really need to worry about. Um, and these, these follow through with quite a few of the different objects within the, the that are provided to you. So again, there's the rendering and the, there's the updating and the rendering. Should do that in reverse 
alphabetical order. Um, so update will always be called first. It will allow you to update your state, tell you how long it's been since you last updated. And then following on from that, you'll be called with render, and then you can convert whatever state you've stored to something on screen. Um, in terms of, because uh, uh, another really quite nice thing with um, .NET MAUI is we, we now get first class support for decent dependency injection. So therefore, actually what um, I will, I can sh show you later on is in terms of uh, a game that I'm currently building is you can register all of your objects through uh, the DI layer, add them as transient services or uh, I'm sure you ever want singleton, but uh, the, the power is up to you. And then ultimately, you could pull them in when you when your scene is loaded, and therefore you can then actually uh, add them straight so that you're which follow following good practices in terms of building things because actually you don't have to care about dependencies of dependencies. You just you could add your object into the constructor of this main scene cool add on it and then therefore you will have your your player object already rendered on screen and you don't have to worry in terms of the rendering or the update you don't have to pass that down that's all that's all managed for you the one bit that we don't currently cover and this is something i would quite like any uh, suggestions on or feedback so obviously with .NET Maui, there's a lot of abilities to bind things together. And it's obviously a, always been a big background in terms of uh, MVVM patterns that work well in the, the binding approach. Um, currently, I've decided not to do that purely because uh, I don't know if it's needed. I always try to stay away from bindings whenever I'm trying to make things as, maybe as fast as possible. And games you typically would. So I, um, I've tried to avoid that here. It's not to say it won't be done. Maybe a game, the our game scene view might have a a property on it that you could set the scene on. Um, or another concept I'm, I am currently toying with is the idea of naming a scene. So actually, you don't have to create it. You could say load a scene, and it will create the scene for you. Um, all things would be nice to to, to get good ideas on. Um, but essentially, so if you say you've, you've got your game, you want to load uh, a scene into it, you just call the, that top method there, load scene, and it will take the one you're passing to it and put it in the, the view that you're giving it. You've then got typical lifecycle uh, life methods. So you can start it, you can stop it, you can pause it. You can state game over at the moment, which allows you to say, well, if your ship's been destroyed in a space game, you could then inform the game scene manager that it's uh, the game is over, and therefore you could then present the, the message to the user to say that they, they've lost. And you've got these uh, events at the bottom to allow you to handle that. So if you're not obviously controlling it, then you need to know when that state's changed. Um, so one thing I didn't say earlier on is that if there are any questions that do crop up, please feel free to ask as we go along, because obviously ask um, more than happy to answer as we go. Uh, and then the final object that we currently deal with is an object, uh, a game object. Now this is very similar to a scene, and actually it's it's becoming even more similar in the fact that game objects can have other game objects as children. So you could, in theory, you could build a complex, what appears to be a complex character, perhaps but you could break it down into single components. And therefore, actually, as we move on to the next slide, you'll, you'll start to see why that becomes important. Um, so trying to keep things simple. I mean, th this, this is probably preached in terms of a lot of general programming practices, but I think being able to visualize it in terms of something like this, I think actually, it helps to hopefully reinforce why. Um, so as an example, we're going to imagine that we're controlling a ship that's that's flying through space. Suddenly, uh, a couple of asteroids appear. 
So now we're, we're going to have to consider what we're going to do with that. Um, so let's say we have to handle the collisions between the two. We now need to have bounding, not boxes, but ellipses around the, the hull of the ship and the asteroid. And if they ever touch, then we need to say, well, the ships look up damaged. But let's give ourselves a way to defend ourselves. Let's stick some guns in the ship. And let's say, um, you know, concept of a game I'm currently building is the fact that the player doesn't have to fire the guns. In fact, it's done based on proximity. So if the asteroid becomes within range of the ship, it will actually then start to fire. Therefore, we've got another bounding ellipsis to say, well, once this asteroid crosses, then the ship needs to fire. Therefore, it's it's going to fire a pulse. Um, one part I realized just before this uh, talk is that I've also then missed a bounding ellipse on the pulse itself, because we then need to know when that has collided with the asteroid. And therefore, then you've got to handle that collision as well. So once that happens, the once the collision has taken place, the asteroid's destroyed, and it's left something that we can then collect. If you we then look at um, how we then go about trying to collect this uh, resource, we are we're going to need another set of bounding ellipses to then say, well, once this thing, this resource has become within a certain range of the ship, then it can be collected, sucked up. I think if, if we start to look at this, and I, I did try to draw up a flow chart that might show how complex uh, the collisions might be just maintaining just the state of the ship, we could, I think you could start to appreciate how complex it, it could be. I, I sadly didn't get it to the flow chart, but I'm hoping that once we start to split it out, we can then start to see. So if we say we've taken what we've, all of those different concepts, we can then actually break it down into some fairly simple uh, rules. We can say that we've got a hull of a ship and that can collide with an asteroid. Therefore, that that's that's one collision that we can we can handle. Uh, we've got the gun that's attached to the hull on the ship, and it will then fire when it comes within range of the asteroid. Again, technically, we can treat that as another collision. The the range ellipsis is colliding with the the asteroid. Uh, and because I missed off the previous part, I didn't put the rounding bit around that pulse, and I have not also put that here, but we could then have a an ellipse around the pulse and showing when that actually collides with the asteroid to cause the explosion and ultimately the resource being generated. Uh, and then finally, we've got uh, the collection process. I couldn't come up with a fancy image to represent something that would collect it. Um, and, but, but, but no, I think as long as we see that once that uh, resource on the right then crosses its, the two ellipses cross, then you've got another collision. And ultimately, it can then trigger the action to say, well, that resource can now be collected. Or like some of the, the typical games where you've got the um, magnetic boosters where it, it, it pulls it. Um, and again, Ah, I really should try and dig out the, the source. There's, there was always this website where you start to say, I want to build a game. I want to add these. And then it asks you a load of questions. Do you want to make it procedural? Do you want to add anything complex in? And it just ultimately tells you that your game becomes unachievable because as complexity goes in, the time scales shoot out drastically. But if we start to say, well, I've got a gun on a ship that can fire. And maybe I want to make it upgradable in terms of like an RPG style game. Then actually, if we've got something that we know does can fire, but we don't care about the implementation, in theory, <laughs> this is where we can say, well, we can just replace it with this bigger gun. Um, and I think by by separating these components out and saying, well, 
the ship can interact with the gun or uh, the gun can fire pulse, then we can get to hopefully fairly small components that don't really care too much about the implementation of the... So the gun doesn't care about the implementation of the pulse actually colliding with the, the, the asteroid to know how much damage it might do. We just care that it fires the pulse. Might not even care what type of pulse, and therefore things like that can be should be swappable. Okay. Um, there's a couple of lessons I have learned along the way. Uh, they the list is still growing quite a bit, but um, I mentioned this briefly before, and it's just this idea of the update update method really does want to be independent from the, the device it's running on it, or the display information. So if you imagine, um, and I can probably show you a terrible example of it uh, in this app that we're going to look at briefly, is we've got a, a space game, we've got asteroids that are spawning and they're all navigating to a point. If you then resize the screen, that point moves. And therefore, you, you get some really quite interesting effects. The, the thought being is, if you say, well, I know, uh, a, a good practice would be to say, well, I'm going to treat my screen, maybe say, treat it as 100 by 100 pixels. You don't care too much. Maybe treat that as a percentage. And you always refer to it as a, uh, within that ratio. And then when you get to your render process, you then convert that to what it's actually rendering on. This this also seems quite important, especially with um, all of the many different devices that we can now run on the .NET MAUI. I think you're running this on your fridge in your kitchen. It's going to have a very different screen to a phone or a um, TV. And actually, uh, I had a bug raised yesterday in the fact that um, I've been building on a, a Mac, so I'm using a landscape view. Someone's tried to run it off on a portrait Android device. <laughs> it looks horrendous. <laughs> so these these are these are lessons that need uh, should should certainly be be applied, and I'm in the process of trying to apply these to myself. Like I say, um, another thing that I Mobile gaming has become really quite great. I mean, it's given us the ability to get distracted whenever we're supposed to be doing tasks. But, and actually, I, I don't, I, it'd be quite interesting to have a, a good breakdown of where people spend their time gaming. If you think, if you've got the ability to, to run powerful games, I mean, I've, uh, an example I'm going to touch on with this next point is uh, running FIFA Mobile on my phone is the fact that it, renders at really quite decent quality, but don't tend to have any issues. Um, you think the power that we've got in these devices, it'd be interesting to see the distribution between what people are running on mobile against consoles or PCs. Um, but with that ability to run on a device that has no real tactile support, you, you lose the feedback that I certainly still crave. <laughs> Uh, so when you start to think about maybe adding in touchscreen support, maybe you're going to have a, some buttons to mash. Maybe if you think of the old like NES controller, you've got A and B. When you start to think, maybe you could try to give some fake uh, tactile feedback in terms of looking at haptic support. Um, I think Apple did a, a very good example with the, so the iPhone 7 where it had a fake home screen and the fact that it pretended that you were clicking it. Actually, if you turn it off, it did nothing. The, the button does nothing. If you have it on, it's just the act of touching it. It provided haptic support to make you think that you are clicking something. So when we start to consider these kind of lessons, making the user believe that they're touching something really does help. And going back to my brief example of playing FIFA Mobile is the fact that you think you're touching it, but actually your thumb's off to the side and you're missing it. Because again, you don't actually have that support to know where you are touching. And therefore, um, if you give them just the slightest bit of feedback, I think it does make a big difference. Um, and another lesson that we learned 
quite late on in a, in a project that we built with, with Xamarin is this idea of audio feedback. Now, actually, I'm quite a silent gamer. I don't tend to have the music blaring on my phone usually because I'm doing it in places where I probably shouldn't be gaming. <laughs> um, but uh, it really does give does give um, a, hot, a big, a whole rounded experience to a game. So if you think that there are resources online, think like Audio Jungle, where you could grab audio snippets if you're not creative. I mean, I'm certainly, I'm certainly no musician. I've got a guitar in the loft that I've, well, it's collecting dust, shall we say. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, like I say, it's, it's, it's really good to experiment with things like this, just to, to get an idea of what it is that you want to portray to the user. Um, and also to know that not every user is going to want the same experience. So there, there will be quite a few, quite a range of um, uh, options to, to, to consider there. Uh, moving on from that, um, I want to add a uh, brief slide on what this framework isn't going to support. So like I said before, it's it's aimed at being lightweight. It's only really aimed at giving you the gaps I think are needed. Now, I'm not saying I know all of the gaps. So again, feedback is, is really quite valuable here. Um, but again, so now, now we're looking at Donna Maui, it, it's what I would now consider a first-class citizen of the .NET ecosystem. It's got all the DI, it's got, it's on .NET 6 now, so it's it's caught up there. So we've got all the ability to, to access the database. We could use Entity Framework if we wanted to. We could use a scroll up SQLite-NET, that's the old Xamarin uh, way of doing things. We could use any API from Essentials. Like, so like I mentioned before, we could use an accelerometer to determine whether whether the user's tilting the device, if they've got a concept like that in the game. And all of that, I mean, some of this is a completely abstracted for us. Uh, so we don't even have to worry about the actual platform specific detail. Um, if I skip off that middle, that third line and actually jump to the fourth one, just because it relates to what I just said, uh, is the fact that if there isn't something that's available to you, is that, you've got access to the platform specific APIs within a .NET MAUI app. So if you wanted to, gosh, now I'm going to struggle to get a good example. Uh, if you wanted to grab camera access, because that's not something that's supplied, you could write something that would interact with uh, AV audio, visual, um, whatever uh, AV session delegates that you get on, Apple devices, camera X that's coming out on Android. The ability is there. Uh, obviously, it's not as easy as having something out of the box, but it's the bit that I've quite liked. And I've not necessarily hit this hurdle with 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 using things like Unity before, but in in that in that regard, you, you're you're quite tied in. You've you've got um, a something that you attach a C-sharp script to, you can run things within the, the rules that they give you. They don't give you access to the full .NET ecosystem. Whereas this, my hope is, you only really want to use this for the little bits, or hopefully more than little, the bits that you need, and then you can delegate out to exactly where you need to go. Uh, so is this lost. screen sharing bar still up there? Uh, it's okay, no, it's okay. fine. Just a quick, quick. I mean, one one thing that came to my mind. Sorry to divide the interruption. Is as is, is gyroscopes because obviously they're driving games or flying games. You can mm -hmm. my kids play them with gyroscopes quite a lot, so you can just kind of lean and tilt. But is that sort of thing already available and working in Maui, or is that something that's that's to come? Or you know, how, what what is support for the for the for the for that kind of on on device physical sensors like at the moment? I know cameras a little bit. Uh, um, hit and miss, but I was I was curious yeah. as to what the support's like for, for that kind of thing. Mm, uh, so yeah, cam camera assisted. But um, I believe now I've not tested it. Is it was there in Xamarin, and I believe that the APIs are now in .NET Maui. .NET Maui. They used to be called Essentials in the Xamarin world. I think they're now just part of the .NET Maui APIs. .NET Maui should support everything that Essentials did, and therefore it should. Can't say I've tested it, um, but uh, I do believe it would be there. 
Thank you. Okay. Um, and then uh, another little concept that I've been toying with is trying to maybe build a multiplayer game or at least adding some quite interesting concepts in. And therefore, with a couple of lines of code, you can actually add Signalara in. There's, there's NuGet packages that are out there to be able to consume it. You could connect to it, and therefore then you could actually maybe in real time update uh, someone else's screen. So a couple of concepts there. We're, we're looking at maybe trying to build a bit like, is it a Scriblio clone where you, or like the old Pictionary days is where you can, one person's drawing and the other people have to guess whoever gets it first wins. And that, that's something that we're hoping to try and push because then I think that's another example of touch support or sorry, user input that's not strictly considered for other things. And then I, at the moment, I'm still trying, there's, there's still this gray area between how much support that .ml gives you and how much that this should give you and where you draw the line between that. I don't really want to, I, there's no plan to make it impossible to do either. In actual fact, I'd, I'd love it if people can. It's just trying to make sure that that's as frictionless as possible, if that makes sense. Or at least fits within, within good practices. Um, okay. So, the as I mentioned, this is, this is this is certainly a work in progress. Um, but I'm hoping to get something done, at least something that I could maybe stick up on NuGet that would then be usable by people. There is there are there's a repo at the moment with the code, and there's two sample games that are currently being built. So, Highly unstable based on some changes I made the other night. <laughs> yeah, we are getting there. Um, so the plan is uh, to try and get to some form of MVP release, like I say, within a couple of weeks to uh, maybe a month. Uh, I'm fully open to a better name. I, I, I am terrible at naming things. And I just gave it a name that was the name of the first game that I started to build with it. Uh, I'd love to come up with maybe something Maui themed. But again, I'm. <laughs> I've got the room to do. We've got the room to do that now before it actually get before it ships. Um, there's a concept there, hierarchical game objects. Uh, this is something I've actually been toying with this week. Is the fact that a game objects can have other game objects as children, and actually that the writing of the slide where we were looking at a ship and make, trying to keep it simple is actually well. The thought being is maybe you want a ship game object and then you want to have the hull as part of it, you want to have the gun as part of it and whatever whatever other components. So that's something that is is in the works and is hopefully going to be done relatively soon. Um, user input handling, I put a question mark. Um, I keep talking around it, but I'm not sure I know I know the answer there. So whether that maybe just becomes a set of recommendations on how you could do things rather than actually doing it until some some until it's possible to maybe gain understanding of how people are using it and actually then push that across. I'm quite quite keen not to reinvent or in provide everything in case there are scenarios where it doesn't necessarily fit. Because uh I guess one part that I didn't give as an instruction to this is um I didn't strictly start this with the idea of building an engine. I did it more as kind of just trying to enjoy the, the journey, as it were. But uh, after chatting to a couple of people, it seemed that there might be some some value there. So uh, I'm hopeful that <laughs> we might get to it. At least it's keeping me busy in the evening, so that's all good. Um, physics. Physics is something I really do want to get in. So obviously, I in that keeping it simple example, I showed... And I mentioned the word collision a lot, and that's the of the idea of two things overlapping really. Um, so I'd like to be able to get that kind of component in in some shape or form. I had something very crude working, but it was just to prove the point. Now I need to, now I need to try and work out how that might fit in terms of a more reusable thing for everyone. Uh, and then when you start to think, consider things like mass and gravity and whether those, because these are, these are all concepts that come from uh, 
proper game engines that you, that you get. Uh, so Unity and things like that, you can say, well, this thing weighs something and therefore then the gravity that affects it. So if you're building something like a platformer and someone's running along and jumping, you only have to kind of for give them the force upwards and then actually gravity will pull them back down. So you don't have to manage that. So I'd like to get to a state of be stage of being able to supply as much as possible to help reduce complexity there. But again, I'm um, more than quite keen to gather people's uh, the problems people are trying to solve, and then we can start to, to look at what might be something that would, would benefit everyone. Uh, diagnostic support, trying to look at so whether that might just be rendering the, the frames per second count on screen. You could just have something that's pre-built to do that for you. Um, You'll see in an ex uh, uh, this example that we're going to look at briefly in a bit is this idea of knowing where the bounding boxes are. So you actually, you could say, well, I've got this thing. It's a circle. It's rendering on screen. I want to know, want to render it on screen so actually I can see that the collisions really are happening when I expect them to, or any kind of diagnostics information. Um, Lifecycle support, so like obviously with, with apps, you get the idea of when things are added, brought to the foreground and background. There might be bits that we need to do there, but also things like when you add your object to a scene or when it's destroyed, things like that where you might then need to go and tidy up some resources. So if you've got something that might subscribe to an event, then you obviously want to unsubscribe from that before it disappears off or doesn't disappear off and hangs on to memory for some time. And then there's uh, a bit of investigation that I've done recently, and that's in terms of testing support. Um, now, obviously, unit testing is is relatively straightforward. Um, there, there isn't too much to mock, but I've been quite keen to consider, well, there are some kind of Maori-specific things that would that would needs to be mocked in terms of what the engine supplies. So maybe if we could provide that as a, a pre-built part of this, then for all you have to do is really just implement the test to test your implementation rather than worrying about any of the extra fluff around the sides. Uh, this has led me on to another concept, and that's this idea of snapshot testing. That's growing, becoming more and more popular these days. Um, and actually, th thanks to as, uh, Matthew Leibowitz of the .NET Mailing team, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, is the fact that we can run, we can build against .NET Mail graphics, but we could swap out and put Skier under the background. Is that actually, we can do the exact same thing to do snapshot testing. So you could say, I've got this. Uh, so actually, if you if you look at the the, f the first line of the, the the test at the top, I've called it scenery just as a um, a name to give it. That's the class at the bottom, which is your game scene, and its sole purpose is rendering that little pale golden rod square in the top left. This is to prove the point. Um, the person writing the test only really cares about that that middle line that's got the, the, the gap around it. And that's the, the act of saying, render my scene on this canvas. And what that does is it will actually save you out a PNG called Jeff, it seems, based on my test name. Um, <laughs> and therefore, what you can do is you could then actually get a visual snapshot of the scene. And now if you're dealing with maybe wanting to actually check how the frames render as well. You could even do multiple if you're saying, well, try and gather a consistent layout or a consistent set of events. Now, this might be really quite um, valuable when you start to look at maybe like a tutorial screen because those typically, they're not as dynamic as maybe a, an actual scene. You, you're you're going to be pausing quite often and saying, well, here's the next thing that you need to learn. Here's the next thing that you need to learn. If you've got snapshots there, then actually, not only do you gain the ability to compare it to the previous one, 
but you could potentially even get some nice fancy little screenshots that you could use for marketing when you come to actually trying to push it out to the stores. Uh, but this is this is again like like I said, this is something in the works. Uh, the other thought is where, whether you could then maybe mock the canvas, but then you've got to deal with the complexities of saying it called me and said that it wants to render a rectangle in these coordinates, which might be more readable to some developers, less readable to others. Some people might just like this snapshot testing. So again, trying to keep the options open, but um, and uh, not not kind of restrict people to specific routes. Uh, there's a, an extra couple of resources that I would quite like to highlight. That's helped me at least on some of my journey. Um, I mentioned Audio Jungle in terms of sourcing that I think the majority, if not all, they're not free, they're paid for, uh, but you can download samples and you can play them in your app. The only bit that I would warn there is on past apps where we built them, it's got a, it's not a watermark. I don't know what the correct term is in terms of audio, but it, it says Audio Jungle over the sound as it's playing. Um, during our beta phases, we had we hadn't paid for the the audio, so we had this this voice saying audio jungle over it quite often. It got to the point when when we removed when we paid for it and we put the proper audio in, it actually felt quite alien to listen to it without that um, uh, overlaid sound. Um, open aim open game art dot org is an uh, a really good resource. That's actually where the graphics came from for this space game that we're going to look at. Uh, and it's it's all I think it's a way for a place for people to upload any of their artwork that they've created. It's all done with the aim of being free, I think, or at least it's like an open source concept. Uh, obviously, if you do make money out of it, then obviously it'd be nice to send some back towards the. Uh, the artists, but they are, they do some really great work. And actually I've, I've been chatting to the guy that, that built the space game artwork because it's levels above what I can create. <laughs> um, and then there, there's a couple of repositories here that I've, two people that I've chatted to that have kind of helped steer a little bit of my thinking. So there's a guy, David Wengier of the, both of them work for Microsoft. One guy works on the Roslyn team. Uh, he built a train simulator app game running in WF and Blazor. So some of his thinking has actually helped influence some of this and some chats with him. And then Matthew, who I mentioned, he built Flappy Bird clone off the skier through skier. So actually that's been quite a good uh, helping point. Um, so that's it in terms of slides. Uh, didn't want to show too well that, that like i say is the the engine itself is meant to be relatively lightweight so therefore it, it shouldn't it doesn't offer you too much but i'm hoping it, it will offer you enough to to go ahead and build a game um i know that we will have those fun game ideas and i've got stacks of paper with ideas written down on that i don't think i'll ever get around to doing but um if there's any concepts that people are keen to even openly share is that I'm actively trying to build as many kind of samples in this repo as possible. Now, obviously it's all open source, but um, I'm not looking to make any money out of this, but just to help grow the engine in terms of seeing what possibilities needs to be available. And also getting a good idea of what people think, what people want to achieve. Um, so on that note, Unless there's any questions, I was going to jump over to some code and show a very brief example of this working or partially working. Yeah, no, I think the, the questions are all just chat in general. So I think go, go for it. Okay. Um, Visual Studio, that's what I'm looking for. Um, I guess I have one one question. Do you have any insider knowledge on when the tooling for Maui is likely to come out? Because uh, the Visual Studio tooling is still in the preview version, isn't it? 
Uh, yes. Um, th there has been talk, and I think they, they're saying in the next couple of months, I think. Um, I think they were aiming for the summer, at least for um, Windows. I think I know obviously Mac has undergone yeah. a lot of um must be rebuilt. Uh I don't know. I mean I, I'm I'm kind of under the expectation that .NET seven is gonna be the safest time to really build maybe something production worthy. Yeah. Um a lot of the stuff I'm doing they've moment. also got they've also got the ARM version of Visual Studio right now, haven't they? Which is must be built yes. first. Oh, okay. Lee Le is saying October. Apparently. October, okay. Okay. So yeah, I mean what is uh next seven is November, isn't it? So yeah. it's probably a pound right, yeah. Cool. Uh, make it as big as possible. So there's not really too much to do in terms of actually using the engine there is a a use orbit engine at the moment that extension method that lets you pull in bits it really doesn't do too much for you at the moment but uh just adds a singleton of the game scene manager this is the way of loading um scenes and whether you want to um uh listen out for state changes in terms of the, the scene that's rendering uh, I have actually added a, a brief clause of documentation here. I think a singleton is the right approach, but some people might want, maybe want to have multiple scene managers if they've got split screen, like couch co-op. You might want to have them side by side rather than having the complexity of having one scene that can render two games. Um, but at the moment, you'd only have to call services.render, tran add transient rather than singleton. I think this would potentially uh, offer up the, the simplest way for now, and I think this should cover most use cases. Uh, Maui program, and then so in this scenario, what we've done is we've got a set of game objects, and I've just added extension methods in each of these. We've got re render game objects, which is this one, and then render scenes, and that's just register. Sorry just trying to put the registration in the places where they, they exist. And you'll see just adding these as transients. So therefore, every time you try and grab a new copy, you're going to get a new 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 instance. Uh, we have cheated a bit on this game. I won't lie. Um, and I don't, I don't know if this is, I think it's right, but you think that the uh, I'll tell you what, let me let me run the game first quickly. You've got this concept of at the moment. <clears throat> uh, the game concept is you've got a, a spacecraft that's that's orbiting a planet. And the ultimate thing is you're gonna have to destroy asteroids that are gonna hit the planet with the added impact that you can only really control the speed. You can speed up or slow down your craft and you've got limited power. You regenerate power when you're in the direct light from the sun. If you're in the shadow, then you don't. So it, that's a little bit of an extra element. I'm not entirely sure how playable this, how friendly, how great, how much fun this game's going to be, but it's a concept I've always wanted to play with and it seemed like a good way to at least um, expose myself to this, this engine idea. Um, so, but then back onto my original point is that I've got a space image there, but that never needs to be re-rendered. So therefore, I don't. Actually, I just render it with a with an image control. I don't pass that across to the the engine library because, like I say, the static never needs to change. And therefore, we can load it once, and then we don't have to consider rendering it more times in multiple loops. Um, we then have a, a game scene view. This is that concept that we covered. And these are some of the events that you can then start to subscribe to. So you've got 
you can start interaction, end interaction. Telesense isn't happy. Cancel. Don't know how that one works. Uh, hover, and then yeah, like I say, drag. So dragging actually works quite well if you're doing like a drawing game, perhaps, because you've got your finger on and you're moving it around. Um, and then we've just got a, a play and a pause button. So what we'll see, if I can get the game back, there's your play button, you click it, it moves around, you can pause it, you can resume. And then you've got these little asteroids coming in and they will eventually hit the planets. But I, like I said, I, I've gone through the process of breaking collision detection. So actually there is no collision at the moment, <laughs> which means you'll, you'll never lose the game at least. <laughs> um, and then when we start to look at some potential debug information, like I say, you could potentially have bounding details to know, well, this is now within the bounds of the ship. It gets very busy very quickly. This. Um, so then you can start to say, well, now I, I know that it should be firing. Of course, if it's not, then you could start to say, well, uh, start to look at why. You, if you get to the levels of writing games, uh, I don't know how, what your math is like, but I, um, I have to keep revisiting my, uh, my GCSE maths. And you'll actually see as a, a lot of the trage trajectories that are destined for these asteroids are actually ever so slightly off. I quite like the randomness of it, but I do need to go and dig into why. <laughs> um, that's that. Uh, so like I say, you've, you've got your scene that you stick on screen. And then in your page, I noticed we don't. We, there's no. There's no binding set up here. It's all kind of um, just going direct. I've got a page. Uh, I'm passing in. So when the page is uh, built for us, because that's that's created through the the service provider stuff that comes from Shell, it will inject all of the dependencies for us. We don't even have to worry about that. Uh, as long as those are registered with the services, then we're, we're fine. And therefore. We can load it in. So actually what you see in this game, you actually see two scenes. There's a home scene. It doesn't really do anything. It's just the, uh, it's just got, put that there. You've just got uh, a sun, a ship and a planet. Uh, the the shadow here is actually a child of the planet, which is this, the the concept that I've been playing with. At, in the past, it was a separate object in itself that was added to the scene, um, but it just starts to feel right that you can have things belong to other things. I think when you start to deal with some state, I think it's, it's going to be needed. Um, and actually that that just this just actually renders it once and it doesn't even I don't believe it calls it back anymore because it's paused. So it's just renders once on the canvas and then it just sits there. And when we hit play, it actually loads this scene, which is a little bit more complex. We've got a ship, sun, the planet, battery level indicator, and then an asteroid la launcher. So what you'll see is and I don't know, this might be a concept to uh, I don't know. I, I always used to work under the, the concept of that an object was something visual. I don't know why, but it's something you're adding to a game, so it kind of feels like it should be visual. Uh, but this is not, an asteroid launcher is not. It's purely something that's added there, and it says, well, after a period of time, I'll just create a new instance, and I'll tell it to go to this, this destination. And therefore, you end up spawning it. It's using at the moment service provider, so it'll just get a new instance because it's transient. Therefore, it'll pop up a new asteroid every time you call that method, and then therefore it'll say, "Well, you want to go to the the middle of the screen? Off you go." And then it gives the details, some movement information to an asteroid, and then it'll just start doing it itself. So all it does is it, it knows. Um, where it needs to get to and how quickly it's going to get there. And therefore, each time you call an update, 
this this comes into the state versus render a little bit. So you say, well, I know I'm going to move by this much each frame, and then actually you convert where it is to on screen, and therefore each time you get a callback every 16 milliseconds, it'll say, well, I'm 0.2 pixels ever so slightly closer to the my destination. Uh, There, there was always a, a really good article from um, was it the guy that made Fez of explaining how uh, it was held together by duct tape, I think, and the fact that <laughs> got to the point of building something so large and complex is the fact that it worked and no one exactly knew why because it looked like it shouldn't. <laughs> um, it's working out how you start to completely separate out maybe some state that might belong to someone else to something that you want to use uh i think that's typically where i'm hopeful that the having the power of things like di would actually benefit us here in the fact that you could say well i want to know about this piece of information maybe about the battery level information that actually probably belongs to the ship but i want to present it somewhere else and therefore i can have this shared state and make it shareable between them purely by the fact of saying I need this information to power DI. Um, so I'm hopeful that should help to, to reduce that, but um, I know full well if we're trying to get something out the door, then actually potentially it, it quite easily run away with us. Um, another couple of bits that I didn't actually mention in slides, and it's something I, I think I want to get to, um, is the fact that actually every game object has the ability to render anywhere on screen, even off screen. It's effectively, when you're told to render yourself, you're given the canvas to draw on. You're told the dimensions of the canvas. So if it resizes things, interestingly, ship keeps rotating. I wonder, if, I bet that's called calling invalidate. Must be, and that's why you shouldn't be updating the state in render. You should do it in. And that's doing that, isn't it? Yes, it's updating the angle in render, which means every time it's called update. So if you resize the screen, it's moving the ship. <laughs> Actually, that wants to be, but if that got moved to update, so I'm not following the practices I've just told you, is that it would then actually stay still. All it's doing is re rendering what it's knows. And if um, so, render should be in it every time you call it, it shouldn't change. It's the update process that should then change because you're being given time information as well. So you're saying some time has passed since you were last called. You know that you can change if you want to based on that information. Someone made the um, comment earlier that um, they really like the idea that you could like pause the game, resize, just to avoid an obstacle, <laughs> and then carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Love it, yes. <laughs> um, and I'm sorry, I think I've kind of lost where I was going with what I was I got distracted with this resizing. Oh, sorry, so yes, you, like I so, said, any game object can render on any anywhere on screen, which in theory I think works quite well because actually in this idea of maybe like a side scrolling, and actually I've got this idea of a, a doom scrolling app where you can scroll to the bottom the depths of social media in a fun way. <laughs> um is this idea of perhaps that the the thing that's scrolling is an object in itself. So actually it would render off screen and it would just slowly move on screen. Um, that works quite well in a way, but there's some scenarios where you might want to say, well, I've got this ship. I really want to kind of encapsulate its coordinates and it's maybe it's some of its rotation information. So these are, these are other things that I think we'll get to. They might come in maybe a second release or at least um, trying to gain some insight as to what, what might be needed there. But I'm just, I'm, I'm at the point where I just want to throw as many examples at it as possible. 
to gain an understanding of what, what is a good scenario here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm um, hoping what, what? there's a... Sorry? No, go on. No, go on, go on. Oh, no, no I, I was just waffling anyway, so it's fine. Okay. Uh, <laughs> one, question, one question which came up in chat is, is uh, do you know if Hot Reload would work with your own engine because you're handling the engine part of it or uh, because it's merely using Maui? Um, yeah, would Hot Reload still work okay with this? I don't know. <laughs> um, that's a very good question. Uh, I mean, technically, we are we're only reloading C sharp code, so I don't see why it shouldn't. Mm. Um, but I don't want to say yes, definitely. I don't. I don't. I don't see why it shouldn't. Like I say, it's, it, it is just re-rendering C sharp. Um, there might be a bit of complexity around where you are in terms of state. I, mean, I, I vaguely remember a demo at was it Build or somewhere where they had different colored bricks and they changed the color of the bricks and they redrew dynamically on the screen and were green from blue or something like that. That rings a bell. Okay. So there are implementations out there which do use Art Reload, whether mm -hmm. it will work with this or not. I don't know. Um, I would like to find out actually, because you think if you're five minutes into a, a game which you're testing and you realize that something's off now, being able to hot reload that would be fantastic. Yeah, just, just being able to kind of get your game state to the right state in itself is half the issue with, with testing, you know, yeah. um, as, assuming you haven't got the mechanism to save its current state and then resume in that saved state uh, in a repeated, repeatable way. Then, yeah. yeah, having access to hot reload and just saying, right, well, let me get myself to that state, and then I can tweak with the objects. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 What, yeah. what has your like development loop been on this then, in terms of like this app in particular, the Orbit app? Uh, so, this started building it for a bit of fun earlier this year. No, I, th I think I, I loosely proved that it could be done in Xamarin Forms, but it literally just rotated images. Um, got to the point of this, it was, it's been a, a little ongoing process for, I guess, the last month or two, I think. Cool. Well, terms of I mean, like the actual development, like the actual iteration of like, oh, that's not quite right. It's not on the right trajectory. Is it like stop, start it? Is it the fact that you've got it on, um, you know, Mac Catalyst? And it starts quick enough and builds fast enough that it's not a problem that, it, that it's quick to iterate on. Like, do you miss hot reload? I guess is is what I'm paraphrasing. Uh, I see. Uh, so I'm gonna fully admit that I I'm still yet to actually fully utilize either the, the hot reload .net or the XAML. I, it's one of those things that I keep forgetting about, and I I get to the stage of. Um, I don't know, I've become set in my ways and I just restart the app. Um, in this scenario, it's probably not been too bad because actually I might, um, initially I didn't have a home scene, so actually you were straight into the game and it was relatively straightforward. I mean, it didn't didn't take any kind of time to get to that sequence to test. Um, you'll notice that I get a lot of bounding boxes up on screen because I certainly have had challenges around working out where things are and where they need to be. Um, and sure, yeah, I mean, Heart Reload would certainly have saved time there. But again, I just have to keep remembering that it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> Although, um, so along the lines of what, something what Carl said is, um, did mention that it might be nice to ship some kind of diagnostics package to be able to make this, uh, the process of getting through the issues easier. And perhaps if you can't use hot reload, perhaps you could save the state, as Carl mentioned, and then say maybe you could then restore that. That might be quite a nice concept if if hot reload doesn't work for some reason. But I, I'm I'm Sad to say, without collisions, a lot, a lot of this actually doesn't offer too much. So this that's the next step that is, is definitely coming. I did sadly break it um, 
not last night, the night before when I was adding in this hierarchical stuff. Um, but that, that will be coming in the next week or so, I think. Sean, can I ask you a couple of quick fire questions? Yeah, yeah go for it. Um, so when you said about the, the rendering on the canvas, is there a Z index around the objects or is it just how they're added? Uh, the, the Z index is, is dictated by how you, the order you add them. Yeah, so, you, so currently you can't switch them, but there's no reason why you couldn't? There's, no, there's future? no reason. Uh, they're, they're, they're ultimately they're, they're held in a list behind the scenes, so we could quite easily reorder that list. And, and if you wanted to fix like a high score or, a, or an incremental score, like in the top right, that would mm -hmm. just be like another, that would just be like the ship, but it would just be fixed in its location and update its score value that's been either passed to it from a shared state or it maintains itself. Yeah, yeah. So um, in theory, it can be two, it can be completely different. You could you could stick a label on there and so a, a dot yeah. Maui label on top and you could render it that way. Obviously, you have to get the information out somehow uh, or you could create your own game object and you could just render it on screen. Uh, like cool. something like a ship. So you could just render that, you could draw text yeah. in here. So you can actually, you could just say, uh, can, you could draw text and you could, you can give it the text and the location where you want to put it. So you could, you could do it that way if you wanted to. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, have you run it on Android based device yet? Um, so I've only done it a little bit, but uh, it's not the worst Android. It's, it's a Pixel 3a, so it's not horrendous, right. but it's it's not top of the range. Uh, it seems to be okay. And actually, I was a little skeptical at first, but um, from some reading I've done, at least on how Flutter performs, that actually performs better. It performs really quite well on Android. Um, and a lot of the belief there is actually it doesn't use much of the Android layer itself. It draws things yeah. on the screen. It uses Skia. So my expectations, it should perform pretty well. Um, obviously, if you start to draw large images and lots of them, that could potentially complicate things. Uh, so you still want to make sure that you're managing the sizes of things like that. But um, I think that's, that, I don't know. It's, it's a balancing act that isn't in the fact that you might be able to achieve what you could from an image by doing this direct graphics drawing, but it probably will complicate the process. It complicates the development process, or the, the actual code that you're writing rather than just sourcing yeah. an image. Um, cool. uh, and, and then actually just, just some thoughts around what you said around the uh, physics engine. Like I think it'd be quite cool. Um, if if that was like a plugin architecture, so not only like gravity, you could then add in like special moves, and and people could then bolt in all these different kind of, and then you could have a library of them, and then people could reuse and share alike. Um, and then and then the second thing was with renders and calculations, like potentially some mechanic where you could separate them out because if something was more intense, you might want to stick it on like a background thread or. Mm -hmm. um to be able to like let the processing run but again yeah yeah, yeah, yeah compete when you're competing with unreal or something like that yeah yeah <laughs> if we're competing with that then i'll, I'll be very very chuffed yeah. <laughs> yeah. um yeah. But, but otherwise really really cool really enjoy it thanks like, yeah. yeah i the, the bit that i've i don't know if it's entirely correct is the fact that uh the scene you see when we update the scene we try to avoid any kind of thread swapping and any kind of locking to try and just be as performance as possible just on a single thread. Um, now, as a slight aside to that, my expectation is potentially some of the user input stuff might be on a separate thread. So actually um, a very brief concept that I've tried tried to put together, which um, is this idea of like an air hockey table where you've got two two paddles and you can have two players. 
and therefore you you control your own paddle and the other paddle will be updated via a signal arc connection that callback can be that can be asynchronous it doesn't have to come in on the thread that you care about for the rendering you just have to translate it once you've got that state to something that you draw, draw on screen um so that's the hope but um I, I do really like this idea of having separate packages or plugins so you could just say well i want to deal with some special mathematical stuff that's going to apply to multiple games maybe some like say gravity physics and obviously we've got new git so actually a lot of that could just be managed for us we have to write the code and the packages but what other people could but i'm hopeful there's room for that and and then uh, one final quick question since uh, this yep. time um the snapshot testing that you kind mm -hmm. of showed uh does that mean or would the intention be that you could also then take them snapshots of them images and then save them and then compare against so assert against the static image so you could automate it uh yeah so that 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 that's kind of the 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 concept of of snapshot testing is um rather than write, having to write a load of assert clauses the thought is is that you could take a screenshot of an app and then on the next run you take the same screenshot after that just the, and then you compare them across the two now um you, you obviously you sometimes run into differences if you're because i think what, what happens is you if the first snapshot you take you then you submit that or commit that to source control and therefore that's your your measuring stick obviously if you then run it on a different device you're quite possibly going to get a different you are most likely going to get a different output so whether you then need to consider uh thresholds room for error so maybe you could say what well, could be one percent different or only take like the middle bit or something like that maybe. yeah 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 um yeah, I mean, I'd I'd like to consider how possibly some kind of UI-driven testing would work, but I think um, in terms of, I think that's got to come from .NET Maui team side of things first. Although I'm kind of trying to closely monitor anything that's going on in that front. It also complicates things in the fact that because you can stick Maui controls on top of the the scene. You, the snapshot testing is only really going to give you an output of the scene, not of the entire screen, if you're if you're mi mixing and matching. So, um, that, that, that's something to consider as well. Cool. Um, do you have any more questions? I could go for hours, but I'm <laughs> cool. um, Well, thanks, Sean. That's been uh, really interesting. I uh, I really like it, and uh, it looks quite approachable. I think uh, I could definitely see, see me using it. Um, a big um, virtual round of applause, please, uh, for Sean. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>